All right. Well, why don't we get started? Welcome. This is a webinar that Cloud Structure is hosting. Cloud Structure is a cloud-based surveillance and security system with remote guarding capabilities. And we are pleased to have two very experienced risk folks, which I'll introduce in a second, to talk about the five ways to make your property more secure. First, we have Christine Malajak. Welcome, Christine. She's the Vice President of Enterprise Risk at Marsh. Uh, and we have Mark Weir, Partner and Managing Director at LCM Solutions. Welcome, you guys. Uh, before we get started, though, um, I, I'm not looking at the chat, but hopefully you guys can. What I'd like to do is, is for our attendees, just quickly put in the, the chat you know, what you might be interested in hearing about and, and maybe what industry you're from, just so our panelists know perhaps how to direct the conversation. So I'll just give you a minute there to kind of type some stuff in. And then, Christine, if you could just let me know when you feel that there's been enough input and then we'll start. Well, maybe because you're recording this and this is going to be um, available to others after the event and we're not sure what their background will be, let's just keep the conversation very general and kind of industry agnostic and focus in, I think, a little bit on the risk and some of the solutions, including the use of technology to help, kind of help bend the cost curve on risk. How does that sound, Lauren? That sounds great. So I'm going to kind of pop into our, our main slide here. We're going to have Q&A at the end. So if there's questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. But let's kick it off. Cool. Uh, well, I'd like to uh, first uh, introduce myself. It's Mark Weir from LCM Solutions. As Lauren, uh, thank you for that introduction. And uh, happy to have Christine uh, alongside to um, uh, provide her valuable insights from a risk management perspective. And so uh, very much looking forward to this opportunity with, with you folks today. And welcome to, to everyone. I'm not sure uh, what time zones you might be in, so it's probably just better just to say welcome. So anyway, one of the things that uh, hopefully you'll find uh, from the presentation today, uh, we've, we've tried to scale this so that you have some practical insights to apply to your business. And, and those insights, if you will, and, and being practical and, and sort of that common sense, it allows everybody to to take a bit of a step back and look at uh, some of the things that they're doing, possibly things that you could do differently or better, and uh, and then uh, choose to uh, then embark on your your own journey as you as you go through this. So, we um, as we put this together, we're really sort of looking at the whole predicting and and how do how do we prevent. And so that's one of the themes as you'll sort of see as we uh, go through uh, this morning's presentation. Um, and of course, I am uh, love my quotes. So I'm gonna share a, a quote with you right off the bat, which uh, uh, Christine and I sort of spoke about uh, yesterday. And of course her comment was, it's, it's, really, a, it's really timeless. So, and it really is. So um, the quote is, is from uh, Benjamin Franklin. From, and this was from 1735. And, uh, so an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so as you, again, go through some of these uh, things, I, I think you'll find that uh, it's, uh, uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of valuable things with it. So maybe, Chris, you can uh, sort of walk them through the, 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 the process of understanding your risks and exposures. And uh, we'll start there. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Mark. And thank you for hosting us, Lauren. Uh, so my name is Christine Malajek, and I'm the Vice President of Enterprise Risk Services for Marsh Canada out of the Edmonton branch. Uh, and my experience and background is I'm not a broker, but I'm a career risk manager. And so for over 20 years, I've worked in the um, health, life and disability, post-secondary, entertainment, oil and gas, construction and public sector space. But there's been like a lot of opportunity to look at risk within each one of these organizations, but there's some common tools and techniques that I think would be certainly helpful. And so understanding the risk and exposure for the overall operation is incredibly important. And what you want to take a look at are two different things. Many uh, organizations and practitioners will focus in on kind of like what's close to them and in, in, within their immediate operations. But I would also submit that what's really important is to start with the area around you. And so anytime I'm looking at, you know, um, a risk assessment for an operation that would then feed into things like either uh, safety, security, or business continuity planning, I like to take a look at what's happening around the neighborhood and using like the hazard identification risk assessment um, methodology 
strategy or framework, um, grab Google Maps. It's easily available, not going to cost you any money. And you know, look at maybe what's within a kilometer radius, maybe two or three kilometer radius that might have an impact on your operation. So one organization that I work for was a health, life and disability company. And so when we took a look at at least a kilometer out, we were, um, you know, within proximity, a stick's throw from the LRT train station, um, you know, and things could certainly happen. We had, um, you know, explosions from electrical uh, conduits uh, in that particular area during the winter when salt water would seep into uh, the underground levels and, and cause um, fires and explosions. We were along a, a, a dangerous goods route. It was over a block over. We would end up with like large tankers and other things of that nature that would go north, uh, south, through the downtown uh, core, but also really close to us was um, the workers' compensation office. And so uh, only a few years prior to that, there was an active shooter incident at that particular facility. So understanding not just kind of like what's happening in your organization, but in the uh, proximity of it is certainly helpful. It also allows you then to proactively look at how you point outwards your security profile in order for you to be a little bit more mindful and aware and get that early detection of things that could be a threat to your operation and property. The next is taking a look at, you know, what are the internal exposures to your operation? And this is what I think where a lot of people focus uh, most of their time on, but looking at it, you know, in a, in a very mindful and deliberate way. So, you know, what are some of the potential fire exposure. So a lot of like health and safety professionals or your loss control professionals that come from your insurance company will typically come with a checklist of things, right? So what are the potential fire exposures? Do you have a commercial kitchen, right? And has uh, the commercial kitchen been serviced lately for your uh, fire suppression, things of that nature? Uh, plumbing. So that would be clean water, dirty water, right? Both of those things make a huge difference in an organization. And, you know, being in Canada, it is not uncommon that if you're not particularly mindful that pipes freeze in the harsh freeze thaw cycles that we do have, then they burst. And it's usually when everyone's away for the Christmas holidays. And, um, you know, you end up with uh, uh, a, a large water release and a great deal of damage, but also theft and break and enters. Uh, so, you know, if you're either in a, a dense urban area with, you know, poor lighting and access to alleyways, or if you're off in an industrial area, you may have some different exposures that you need to be incredibly mindful of when it comes to um, uh, theft and vandal uh, theft and break and enter vandalism also as well uh, can be part of that very same assessment. So again, um, are there uh, fences, buildings, things of that nature, and um, especially in urban areas, um, you know, you see a lot of people tagging buildings. Nice, beautiful canvas for uh, for people with cans of spray paint. And um, what you know, one of those solutions that people uh, and organizations and building and property asset managers have taken is putting large murals up. So when you see a large mural on the side of a building, it's not necessarily to create urban art, but it's also a deterrence for things like vandalism. In Canada, um, Canada Postal Service has actually wrapped a lot of the um, post boxes for that very same reason. So they have like, you know, different graphic designs to prevent vandalism from happening. Also weather related incidents. We're in a time where, you know, extreme weather and catastrophic losses are almost a more common occurrence than what we'd ever wished or thought of or conceived. Once in a hundred floods here where I live seem to be happening every other year. We're experiencing right now an abundance of um, boreal forest hazard and fires. So even though we're in the, the major city, we end up with uh, smoke exposure, but also people who are involuntarily migrating into our cities and staying at hotels or you know adjacent um, welcome and reception centers um, because they're decanting those communities. But also as well, you want to take a look at the other liability related exposures. And again, your uh, insurer either might have a checklist or they might have a loss control expert who can help you with this. So what you want to take a look at is where your guests might slip, trip and fall, right? That's usually the number one loss exposure to many operations that have invited guests onto the property. You want to take a look at stairs, other surfaces, making sure that the handrails are in place, that there aren't any impedances where you might maybe require anti-slip surfacing that you uh, look at mindfully maintaining those areas or building capital plans to include those. But also as well, any additional property damage. If if things are broken, 
or in a state of disrepair or vandalized, that actually attracts more damage and vandalism and bad behavior. So you ever go to the gap and you see the table and a clean, nice folded table kind of stays that way. But once you end up getting really busy and it gets tossed up a little bit, everybody makes a mess of the table. It, it's that kind of psychological piece that comes along with it, that if you, if the property doesn't look clean, tidy and respected, other people's won't, won't see it in that very clean, tidy and respected way. So it's part of that principles of crime prevention through environmental design that you just want to be mindful of the broken windows theory. If it's broken, fix it. If it's dirty, clean it, right? Uh, if you have exposures that are a little bit higher risk, so let's say you're running um, a condo building or a hotel or some other uh, property that has things like pools or rec centers, being incredibly mindful of um, you know, what that exposure looks like, minding your operation about how you're going to manage that risk as well. But also other public spaces, right? So if you've got common areas like um, lounges, lanai's, barbecue areas, laundry rooms, parking garages, things of that nature. These are all spaces that you should be considering, you know, again, the lighting and um, other safety and security features to that area. But also as you're going through this assessment, what are your hours of operation? So we don't have an abundance of money to keep people on staff. So making sure that we're mindful of when we need to have people on and when we can maybe use technology to help augment uh, those after hours um, strategies. Also as well, we talked a little bit about where we might integrate people onto our property, but not necessarily have that staff. And this is kind of where like our duty to warn and make people aware of some of those hazards comes in as part of that risk management strategy. So signs about not having uh, lifeguards at the pool that you're using it at your own risk, that you're using the gym equipment at your own risk, and that people with health issues should be, you know, consult their physician and be mindful of, of uh, their health and safety while they're using those particular facilities. Um, but also as well that you're, main, you're providing and you have a good line of sight on what the maintenance program for your facility is. So how often the pools get cleaned, how often the HVAC um, uh, gets serviced and things of that nature. It not only provides a great um, health and safety approach to, your, to the workplace and to your guests, but it also helps to prevent uh, unnecessary business interruption and mechanical uh, breakdown. But again, also with that, if you know, your fire suppression system hasn't been serviced in a while and you do have a fire and there may have been an opportunity to intervene with fixing something or repairing something that could actually have a material impact on mitigating some of those hazards. But also as well, where you don't have enough human intervention or footprint or uh, line of sight on things, security and surveillance is always uh, a good way to augment where you don't have boots on the ground. So, you know, uh, having doors that are locked that may have a buzzer or uh, a device that links to a camera that allows people to open doors or somebody who is remote monitoring something after hours, if you have multiple properties someplace in a central location, certainly always very helpful. But once you get through all of that, then you need to organize your plan and using uh, the security approach of the five D's is typically a great way to do it. So deterrence, that's all your signs and ways to make sure like out perimeter fencing to make sure people know that this is my territory. This is my space. And there, if you cross it, you're trespassing. Also, if you come onto this property that you have your uh, some of your own duty of care to be mindful of things because things are unattended, right? Detection, that's where you either have a visual line of sight from an attendant or from your security system to be able to uh, see people who are on the property and what some of those activities that you want and those behaviors you want and those behaviors that you don't want that you need to intervene in. Delay, things like locks and other systems that you need to prevent uh, or that, that delay people from being able to gain entry where they're not supposed to. Um, and deny as well, but also defense. And so this is where you, if you know you don't have enough staff or you're using um, surveillance-based security, that then you're able to see that something is happening and that you intervene. So much litigation that happens in Canada, the United States is based on response. So how quickly you were able to deploy your response. So that, that defense piece is gonna be incredibly important. And that response could include calling fire, ambulance or the police to help intervene. So with that, I'm gonna pass things back over to Mark to talk a little bit about how to build your checklist. Christine, that was uh, 
a, a fairly exhaustive list, and I know that there's probably a few other things that that you didn't check on, but boy, you got you got a lot of them. So uh, that's a that's a big ask for the for the participants to sort of consider uh, as they look at their their exposures and their property, and um, so building the checklist is. Um, you know, when, when you look at all of those various different elements that you just spoke of, um, it, it's, not, it's not sort of a, a one-shot deal. You can sit down and just sort of put it all together. It's part of your, I'll just say your operational, your um, standards of, of procedures and how you sort of manage your property. And, and if you're doing this for the first time, you'll probably take many of those things, uh, Christine, that you've spoken about Put them on a, on a list and, and try and prioritize them depending on 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 you know what the exposures are, um, what the what the hazards are, and then from there you're going to start building this checklist. And the checklist is like anything else. So first and foremost, as you put the items on the checklist, they have to be actionable. So the checklist is is something that you can use to refer to throughout the year maybe there's certain timelines certain dates that you would you know use or or choose to do things in given your um given the exposures or the risks that you have in front of you uh, so it needs to be something that you refer to and you actually record uh, and this is important as well where you not only refer to it but you actually record the activity and things that you actually do on the checklist to make sure that things have been covered off and, and things are, are the way that you want them to be. You need to look at the things such as, you know, your personal safety and property damage and things that are, are at risk. So those are the, the, the big items that, that Christine had spoken about, list them all. There will be things that are, are time sensitive uh, based on whether it be legislation, uh, whether it be on on uh, governance or, or certain compliance items uh, as it relates to your operations, those items they need to be very specific as far as how you go about managing that checklist and and taking that activity. Christine uh, mentioned a lot on on maintenance and and what that can do and should do. So as as things happen within your organization, you'll have events, you'll have incidences. Those things are all sort of will, will form part of what you're collecting and the information so that you can uh, reduce those claims, exposures, events in the future so your property is more secure and it protects the people that are, are entering into the property or from the property. And of course, the last item that is, is, is equally as important is that the sort of the audit and verification of the things that you would go back and, and look at that list, whether you look at it, you know, weekly or monthly or, but at least you're, you're, you're coming back to it. You're making sure things that are supposed to be done are done and done in a timely manner. So with that, I'll pass sort of the next section over to, uh, to Lauren or one of her colleagues to talk about um, invest in, in your own safety. And, and I know cloud structure with their technology uh, provides a very unique situation, very unique technology to bring, bring forward and, and protect and secure property. Uh, and and the, the data that they have is, is equally as important that we will talk about uh, and include as part of the, the ways to secure your property. So this is really all about protecting people your property and really your prosperity, because there there needs to be uh, with whatever you're doing and whatever property you're managing, the the matter of of ensuring that there's value in what it is that you're doing for all of the stakeholders is 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 important. So Lauren, I'll let you uh, carry on and talk a little bit about cloud structure. All right, great. Thanks both of you for for such great information. Christine, you talked a lot about some of the exposures, and I'll just mention a couple of them that stood out for me for what our you know, customers are, are looking for. But, you know, slip and falls, for example, are they real? Did it happen? Can I find it? You know, uh, how fast can I find it? Theft, uh, break-ins, how quickly can I get the information to the police? 
really checking lighting, all that stuff, you know, we, we take a look at when we're deploying in a customer situation. So essentially we are a cloud-based solution. So what that means is typically what we find, I would say about 70 to 80% of the market right now has an on-premises solution, which means they have a server on the location that's capturing uh, the video footage uh, for the security. And, and that does present itself uh, some element of risk, right? Because something could happen to the server and, and it could be flooded, it could be fire, someone could steal it. So so early on in, in our development of our product, we, we really started from the cloud. We're actually one of the first cloud native solutions. So all of the video storage is in the cloud uh, and you can store it for an unlimited amount of time. Uh, we work with any cameras or speakers on your customer premise, which is really a, a nice factor. Uh, a lot of on-premises solutions and other solutions require that you work with their proprietary cameras. We work with any camera type, which essentially allows you to preserve your investment. So, you know, if you, and, and what we find is most people don't even know what they have in terms of camera types. And the good news is, is we come in and generally we can work with most, if not all of your camera types. The reason why we have speakers in there is also because we have a new solution. And again, Christine touched on this, which uh, is, is remote guarding. And I'll get to that in a second. So essentially we have a, a cloud video recorder, which is capturing uh, all the video footage, sending it up to the cloud. We do our analytics up there. And what kind of analytics do we do? Well, we tag everything that goes into the cloud. So that essentially allows you to find anything very, very quickly uh, within seconds. You know, if you if you had an incident occur and you don't know exactly when it was over the last two days, but you know that the person had a backpack on, you can uh, you can search by backpack and limit your video footage and, and look at maybe two or three uh, incidences where there was someone with a backpack and find that within minutes, where previously it would have taken you hours to find someone like that. We do other analytics uh, such as license plate recognition, uh, facial recognition, people recognition, you know, very, very sophisticated analytics. And then I'm, I'm just going to touch on the remote guarding piece because it, it really is critical that someone's watching your space. If you're not watching your space in the off hours, um, it's nice to have peace of mind knowing that there's what we call remote guards, you know, giving you that off hour support, watching if people are coming into a common area and going into the pool at, you know, two in the morning where, you know, something could happen. And we're actually finding that that is happening very often in a lot of our properties where people go into the pool area after hours. And it really does increase safety because this is where the speakers come in. The speakers come in where you can talk down and say, hey, you're in a, an area which is closed please, you know, get, get out of the area. If you're in a parking garage, it's two in the morning and the guard sees someone that looks a little suspicious walking around at two in the morning. And then a resident comes in and is, uh, it looks like an unsafe situation. You can have a talk down experience where that remote guard is saying, Hey, you know, I get out of the area. There's somebody there. Um, in 93% of the cases when talk down is used, the incident is avoided. It's very, very powerful. And so, and, and because we can do this now in the cloud, physical guards are very, very expensive. Four to 5,000 a month for your typical physical guard. So we can go in with a remote guarding service and, and literally for a fraction of the cost, provide eyes on site everywhere. So that kind of touches on a, a little bit about what, what you all were talking about in terms of reducing your risk. It's, it's a technology solution that's affordable. It has a very big ROI in terms of reducing your risk, your security, making your property actually more attractive for someone to stay there if you're in a multifamily complex, for example. If you tout that you have this kind of solution, people feel safer and they're, they're gonna stay there longer and you'll have less people moving out due to unsafe incidences. So, so that's just a, a, a touch on what we provide. Happy to provide more information uh, to you all after the fact, but I guess we can move, move to item number four. Great. Thanks, Lauren. That was uh, very, very insightful. And I, I noted your, uh, you know, the top of your slide there was an invest in, and gather data, which is really key to the decision-making ability for those managing people that are managing properties. And so one of the things that I'll speak about briefly is, is really about gathering this data and the data that that 
people sometimes people don't think that they have any data, and of course, um, with cloud structure, they they have some proprietary data and, and information that they gather and provide to their customers, which can be used to analyze and, and, and look at the risks and exposures that they've got. But I think the other thing that is also key is that in, in many situations, the average organization, they have data, but you just have to sort of think about the various different uh, situations or incidences or or things that actually happen. And part of that will come actually from the, from the checklist and looking back at some of the, the situations that have happened. And as, as you've done things, you'll be able to sort of gather and record that activity. So it's really about taking the proactive steps in reducing claims and the cost of claims. And the hiring of professional vendors will also uh, allow you to have some ability to reduce your your exposures and and your risk and ensuring that you've got the right people at the at the right place at the right time doing the right job so that's uh, that's also key to that as and um, when you're tracking your incidences to make sure that you're taking the remedial action and taking those those proactive steps to look at those exposures and, and figure out a way as to what to do uh, and how to, how to uh, reduce them. So um, with that, maybe I'll, I'll move it over to, uh, to Chris for um, the whole uh, notion of um, the next uh, section, which is being engaged and accountable. So Chris, do you wanna sort of have a go with that? You bet. You know, as a property owner or a property manager, risk manager, or whatever role that you play in the organization, you are playing a risk management role. And it's your responsibility as an owner, operator, whatever the case may be, to help ensure the safety, security, and um, preserve property of for the organization that you work for. And, you know, certainly what you want to do is continue to demonstrate that you're a good steward of that program and that you're fulfilling your, your legal duties and obligations under the jurisdiction of law that you operate in. So, you know, we have um, a number of things that we had mentioned up at the, at the top. So things like having an appropriate maintenance checklist, having an appropriate um, uh, checklist for looking at daily hazards around the property. And, you know, all of these things do kind of come together at the end of the day with respect to insurance in various jurisdictions and under various types of programs to demonstrate you are a good risk. You know, no underwriter wants to put money on an organization that doesn't do risk management well. Like if they're afraid that, you know, you're not doing maintenance on any of your fire and life safety or your, or your HVAC systems, there's a strong possibility that there's going to be some sort of a mechanical breakdown. They could end up with a business interruption loss. They could end up with a flood. They could end up with a fire. They could end up with guests being hurt. Nobody wants to be on risk for that type of stuff. So making sure that, you know, you take control of that piece and do that on behalf of your organization, not only helps to ensure, you know, the best employee and guest experience, but it also demonstrates to you know, again, the lenders and your insurers that you're running a good shop, that you're a good risk, right? And so what we'll also do is ensure, hopefully, that you've reduced the number of claims that you have because you have control over your premises. And those claims could be, you know, either third party or internal. You know, a good example of, you know, having good controls in place and, and being able to manage your own internal exposure would be on theft. So one organization that I worked for had a, a very large food and beverage uh, component, and uh, it was through the use of uh, CCTV and a tip from an internal employee that it was noted um, that people were removing um, food and beverage um, materials, so things like large loins or liquor or whatever the case may be, because they had a side hustle doing catering. And so, you know, those types of exposures, you know, you might not necessarily put towards your insurer, but they could also affect your balance sheet, right? And so also as well, like where you have slips, trips and falls, reducing that also is more likely when you're submitting your claims experience to translate into better premiums and better markets for you to access. Um, but also it, understanding, you know, where you are in the current space of things like 
deductibles. The condo market here in, in Canada is not awesome, right? From a liability and a property perspective. So showing that you are a good risk and that you have all of these um, checks in place and that you are managing the property well, certainly provides you with um, opportunity to um, uh, find better markets in a hard market and where you have very limited capacity. But also what you want to do is that you're not done, right? You want to communicate this continuous improvement that you're having in your operation with your broker and your markets. And so continuously showing, hey, like this year we've made an investment into a new perimeter fence to keep people out. Um, this year we noted using our um, CCTV and through our grounds inspection that we noted a goat trail. So a goat trail is when people make a path usually on your property that is not in, by design, right? So they're shortcutting through your property, which could become a, a hazard exposure for you. But what you've done, in fact, is you've um, you've created a fence around that in order to keep people away from those hazards, right? But you also want to communicate where you're seeing these types of trends in your reporting and in your analysis to your tenants or the people that um, are, are using your property and, and make suggestions on how they can help you help everybody reduce claims on the, and, and loss exposure on the property. So again, you know, continuously um, advising tenants about the use of pools and the use of the pool after hours and the use of pool with your guests. If you bring a guest on, you have to then socialize what some of those rules to the pools are. Um, and you know this you, you need to be accountable and, and you need to be continuously engaged in your own risk management and safety of your property it's not a one and done anytime you have a material change in risk as well for your operation i would submit that you go back and you review your risk assessment so material change in your operation could be that you you've actually put in a pool and you've operationalized that you put in a new barbecue area in the common area um you've either reduced or you've expanded your hours of operation. All of these things uh, have a material impact to the security program that you've designed, your safety program that you've designed, all of the checklists that you have, and you wanna make sure that they're all still thorough, accurate, complete, and completely relevant. And so uh, with that, Scott, uh, pardon me, Mark, I just wanted to throw it back to you to see if you had any other comments on being engaged and accountable. Well, I think you've uh, you've covered it off. I think it's, uh... Um, I think everybody has um, has um, a real duty, if you will, to not um, give up their their authority without knowing, you know, what they're what they're actually giving up. And so, I, I think it's it's just really important to to be, you know, present and and to be involved and and engaged at, at the end of the day. Um, even though it's it's easy to advocate and give give authority and to have someone else do it because that's the easy way out. But uh, unfortunately it has a lot of downsides in doing that. So, uh, but yeah, you, you, you've covered it off really well. Thank you. Yeah. And I guess the, the only thing I would also add is, you know, technology is, it can really help you out here um, whether it's access control, you know, really organizing who comes in and off your property and being notified if, you know, it, it's not the right person or, or the technology of security and surveillance on your property or remote guarding. Um, and, and so it really is wor sometimes worth, it sounds, you know, at, at first you're like, oh, I don't know if I can afford this, but if you really take a look at what it can do in terms of reducing your risk, increasing your safety, uh, it really does, uh, give you a good return on investment. So, um, really, uh, uh, happy to have you guys here. Uh, very good information. How about we open it up uh, to Q&A? We don't have uh, too many participants, but I'm going to stop sharing and, and open it up uh, and, and see if we have any questions. Please put your, yeah, there is one question in here. Um, it says, uh, can the video tagging technology you mentioned actually identify things like repeat offenders, bad actors before they trespass? Thank you so much, Warren, for that reminder because it was on my list of things to, to mention. Um, that that is exactly what our technology does. Um, if if for example, there's someone that repeatedly comes on your property, we do have the ability across all your locations, by the way, not just one. Um, but if that bad actor uh, or repeat offender comes onto any property, uh, you can be identified via an alert. Um, and this does make the surveillance less reactive and more proactive. 
Um, and that that's where we are today. Like a lot of folks are using the technology in a very reactive way. Oh, let me look, let me look for hours about what happened. Um, but with remote guarding and alerts uh, and artificial intelligence, you really can take a proactive approach uh, and stop crime, theft, accidents uh, before they happen. So yeah, thanks for that question there. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions. Uh, there's two in the chat box next to the Q&A box. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, how, how can you reduce your risk and overall cost of insurance applying cloud structure? Um, I mean, I, I can answer that, but I'd rather ask the risk insurance folks. Um, so Christine or Mark? I think Christine sort of touched on it when she was uh, talking about uh, uh, the exposures and, and just uh, looking at uh, cloud structure being the technology to actually um, delay as she went through the five Ds and, and sort of defend, if you will, all of those that, that exposure. But I'll let Chris uh, carry on with that, uh, that response. Thanks, Mark. So I think it goes again to the overall risk management system that you have on the property. It demonstrates between understanding what the hazards are externally, internally, having good uh, checklists, but also having the means of being able to have, you know, um, early detection, uh, being able to preserve information and also to help with defense, right? So it's not just a matter of, you know, can I, can I see something and, um, call the police, but you know, are you able then to translate that information into a defense position for the insurer? So some will, some underwriters may see a very holistic program as a very, including something like cloud structure or any other type of um, surveillance service as being uh, a good addition to the overall risk management posture of your portfolio. Yeah, and, I, and I'll say that we do work with uh, some of our property management companies uh, to approach insurance uh, companies about how our technology does reduce risk. Uh, and we are seeing that premiums are being reduced uh, because it is uh, it is a deterrent and it, it does may have an impact. Um, okay, next question is, why do brokers not promote adopting more preemptive based technologies? Do they want higher premiums? <laughs> Well, you know, I would say that I don't know if all brokers have a sense of risk, good risk management techniques and how to make bad things not happen. There's a lot of really great brokers out there who are really good at insurance, right? And so I think it's a matter of being able to find the right partner that suits your need. But also as well, going back to the accountability, you also need to be accountable for yourself. Right. So regardless of who uh, is your broker, you are responsible for managing your business. So that do do what you can within the space of your control for the health, safety and security of your own organization and make sure that you find good partners out there that will help transition that maturity into a program that is more suitable for your operation. Yeah, and Mark, feel free to chime in at any time uh, on additional comments if you have anything there. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, taking it all in. Okay. Everybody else, yeah. Yeah. So good. The, the 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 next question is is how can I communicate with my insurance advisor uh, 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 better risk uh, not investing in technology, so crowd structure, securing best coverages and terms. You know, I, I guess I'll turn it over to you guys, but one thing I can say is we work with our customers to help them um, sort of identify and list ways that they are reducing their risk using our technology and, and help them position uh, that with their insurance provider. Um, it does take a little bit of work, but it, it definitely is uh, working out and it is part of our ROI calculation with the with the customer. Um, but uh, how about you guys? Um, is there a way that you would advise that folks uh, do this? Well, let me put like not not my um, insurance industry hat on, but maybe the risk manager hat that I've worn for many years. And so it was our responsibility to tell our story. And so being able to go line by line a business and be so if it's your liability, if it's your property, if it's your crime coverage, your cyber, whatever the case may be, you got to tell your story. So 
not just fill in the application and here you go, good luck. Underwriters want to see what kind of risk you are. So whatever story you can tell, and either, you know, one uh, case I worked for an entertainment company. So we had our, uh, our media and communications team put together uh, a video for a DVD to go to the London market. In another case, we put almost together like a, like a risk report that went to, and we indexed it just like it was a professionally written report for the market. You might have to just, you know, collate something in an index. Just here's for the market here from a liability perspective. We have a great signage program. Here's some of the signage that we have from a property perspective. Here's here's some of the maintenance schedule that we have. You know, we also from a security perspective, here's the stuff that we do on a proactive and a reactive and responsive basis to make sure that we we have a good line of sight of what's happening on our, our premises, both from kind of an invited guest, a trespasser, and from a, uh, a an employee perspective. But it's your job to tell your story. Yeah. And, and if you, if you're not sure, I would just say also ask your vendor if there's particular, um, you know, ask them what, uh, how do you quantify how your technology is reducing risk? Cause they can help do some of this legwork for you. Cause what we do recognize is that especially in property management and other real estate uh, property folks, time is, is, is short and telling the story can take some time. So if you can get others to help you tell your story, uh, definitely uh, do that. Uh, and we we are always happy to do that for our customers um, to, to save on time. Um, okay. A any other questions? Let's see if, oh, let me go back to see if there's a Q&A. Okay. I think we're, we're good on that. Um, okay. Well, I think it's perfect. 945. We were hoping to wrap it up at 45 minutes. Um, thank you both, Christine and Mark, for, for the great conversation. Uh, I don't want to promise anything, but I'm hoping that we can create a blog from this uh, with uh, with the tips and tricks that, that Christine and Mark have shared with us today so that you can also uh, get this information and quickly read over it and save it uh, if you find it valuable. Um, and anything else you want to add in closing comments, Mark or Christine? Well, I, I think the you know your last sort of comments and, and Christine sort of uh, touched on it is is really, the communication is, is really key through through all of this and 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 being able to communicate internally as well as externally is um, uh, is is a, is a significant uh, uh, skill set and uh, and it's a, it's obviously very important and to be able to do that so i'll just say communication and and uh, you know be engaged excellent and start somewhere and so, you know, I appreciate that sometimes you just, you get started in the middle of a budget cycle and don't necessarily have money set aside for big investments, but start somewhere, start with just being able to do a, a hazard assessment or an environmental scan of what's happening around you internally and start to build those checklists. Once you start to develop those internal checklists and get your claims data together from your insurer and from your, your TPA, and then you can start to take a look at losses and trends. And then this way, when you, in this fall, when you start going into budget meetings, you can start making um, the business case for investment. So if you need to make an investment into signs that say no trespassing, if you need to make an investment uh, into fixing uh, stairwells or, or maintenance programs, if you need to make an investment into something much more sophisticated, like um, a video-based security system or augmenting it in with uh, something that is actively monitored and video-based, then that's something that you should be doing. But start somewhere and then build yourself up to a more robust and sophisticated program. Rome wasn't built in a day and neither will your program, but start somewhere. Terrific. Well, thank you again. Um, if you have any questions, uh, attendees, yeah, feel free to follow up with Christine, Mark, or myself. We'll definitely put our contact information in our follow-up. Thank you for attending um, and have a great day. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.